Good afternoon. Teresa Taylor. Here. Ruth Holton Hodson for John Chung. Here. Danny Brown for Richard Gillihan. Here. Henry Jones. Here. Priya Mother. Here. David Miller. Here. Bill Slayton. Here. Alan LaFaso for Betty Yee. Here. Please note Mr. Rubakava and Ms. Brown joining us on the at the committee level. Uh, first of all, I want to apologize to, apologize to everybody for the late start today, but there was a lot of business to be discussed this morning that you'll see here in a little bit. Part of that being that the report that we're waiting to get printed for you is still about 10 minutes out. So it'll be in the back of the room. We'll let you all know when it's here. We're going to continue on with the first part of the uh, meeting until we get to that point. Uh, but there were a lot of moving parts that we were trying to deal with. So just so you all know. Uh, it brings us to agenda item two, executive report. Ms. Lum. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, Donna Lum, CalPERS team member. In the interest of time, I'm going to provide you with a very brief executive report this afternoon. I do have two updates that are related to the CalPERS benefit education events for you today. Uh, first is an update on the event that recently took place this past weekend at Olympic Valley on May 11th and 12th. This is one of our, one of our most remote ev um, events, and we use it as a bridge for our members that are in the more northern and eastern part of the state. We had nearly 400 attendees, which represents an increase of 25% over the last time that we were at this location. We also had members that traveled from as far as three hours away to be able to get to this event. So again, it does indicate that um, the effort that we put into some of these smaller events in the, in the remote areas are really well attended by our members. We did have a very uh, kind of little exciting event that happened on Saturday. Um, unfortunately, there was a false fire alarm that took place, and uh, we were fortunate that one of the members that was attending the CB was a, fire a firefighter, and he geared up, made the call in, and uh, along with our team members, we were able to calmly get all of the members out of the classrooms, get them to the evacuation location, and likewise calmly get them back into the classes. It was about an eight minute impact, um, but certainly it was probably the first time we'd experienced something like that, and we were very pleased to know that the staff were able to handle that very well. In addition to that, um, our next CB is going to be held at, in Riverside at the Riverside Convention Center on June 15th and 16th. The second update that I wanted to provide to you regarding the CBs is that uh, we have the final schedule that has been prepared for the first half of 2019. If you recall, in March, I, pre I provided the schedule for the remainder of 2018, and now we have the rest of the schedule for the first half of 2019. We have prepared flyers there in the back of the room, and I believe that uh, you received the flyers as well. The dates and the locations have all been updated on the CalPERS website. And uh, again, we are very pleased with uh, the level of attendance uh, that we are seeing at all of the CBs and the feedback that we've been receiving. And the team did want to once again thank Mr. Fechner for his attendance at this event. The next update uh, is related to the regulations, the proposed regulations uh, regarding full-time employment that we brought forward to the committee in February for your approval to move them on to the Office of Administrative Law uh, to be released for public comment. The public comment period began on April 13th, and to date, we have not received any comments. In addition, there have been no requests for a public hearing, and the final date to request a hearing has passed. The public comment period will end on May 28th, and assuming we receive no comments, we will be prepared to bring the regulation back to you in June. However, if we do receive comments, we'll need sufficient time to respond to them, and we will bring the regulation back for final adoption at a later date. Lastly, I just wanted to share with you um, that we, um, the, office, or the building that our San Diego Regional Office is in <coughs> is going to undergo some mandatory maintenance on May 23rd. Uh, therefore, the building will not be open to the public from 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. We are being very proactive, uh, notifying the membership that the regional office will be closed for those two hours. Uh, fortunately, we only had three pre-scheduled appointments, and those members are being contacted to reschedule, and we will make sure that we can accommodate whatever their needs are in terms of timing for the rescheduling the appointments. 
Um, in addition to that, we'll work closely with building management in the future to try to minimize closures um, that would impact our membership. So, Mr. Chairman, that completes my report, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. I do want to say again, a pleasure it was to go to the CB. The staff's always very attentive to everyone. I was the first uh, main session I went into, there were actually only three empty seats, which was really nice to see, especially in such a remote location. Beautiful, cold, but uh, <laughs> it was great to see so many there. And I actually talked to that firefighter uh, before that happened. So uh, it was good to see a, a good turnout, what I thought was there, especially for such a remote area. Okay. So thank the staff again for another great job. We will, thank you. Thank you. Ms. Bailey Crimmins. Good morning, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Leanna Bailey Crimmins, CalPERS team member. For my opening remarks, I have three highlights. The first is to update you on the CalPERS data warehouse solicitation. The second is to share some good news. We actually will have a mobile app for the health open enrollment period, so we're gonna highlight that. And lastly, provide just a quick executive summary on what to expect from today's Pension Health Benefits Committee agenda items. So for the past 14 and a half years, CalPERS has contracted with a third-party data warehouse and actuary analytics firm. One of the key reasons CalPERS is a strong negotiator when it comes to rates is because we run analytics against our own data warehouse. We have the data and the science to know exactly what the aggregate member claim information is so we can accurately account for the medical and pharmacy services we are consuming as an organization. Since CalPERS is not for profit, our annual health premiums must accurately reflect the true cost of care. Therefore, having the cost history is fundamental to the annual rate negotiations with our health plans. I also like to point out that all the health data is aggregate and it's masked. So CalPERS does not have specific details on any one individual member's information. We instead look at the population as a whole. November 2019, our current five-year contract expires, and during this year's solicitation, the health team did something different. We actually did a phased procurement approach. Our requirements were the same, but many of you know that analytics and technology is advanced, and so we wanted to make sure our solution took advantage of these advancements. The phase procurement required several stage gates. The first was of August of 2017. We had minimum qualifications sent out to the community, and we had 23 bidders that were interested. Then we went through another stage gate that we actually provided the detailed business and technical requirements. At that point, we then got down to 10 bidders. And then we did decided to do a proof of concept because when we look at proposals, they look one way on paper, but in actuality, we want to see how it's going to work, how the team is going to work with our team. And so we had another session where we ran the vendor through with two top vendors through what um, typical analytics we would normally need, how well they worked with the team, and how well they did the knowledge transfer. In addition, we made sure that we had third-party validation on business capabilities. We don't want smoke and mirrors because it looks one way. Some we wanted to make sure we knew exactly what we were getting ourselves into. So of the top two, we ended up on April 27th awarding the new contract to Truven Health Analytics, who will legally become IBM Watson in August. I would like to personally thank our current vendor, Milliman, for their hard work and dedication, and we look forward to our new partnership with Truven Health Analytics for the next five years. For the second item, have you ever wanted to have CalPERS member self-service health plan information at your fingertips? Our members remind us that they have their smartphones on them all the time, and so if you want to look up health plan information, who wants to go and drive home and access it via computer desktop? So I'm excited that we are developing a new mobile app that will provide help, health open enrollment information that is currently available via, via the MyCalPERS member self-service. So this includes viewing health plan information, coverage information, using find a medical plan search tool, the ability to compare plans side by side, and also for retirees, making a plan change. And then the highlights to um, look forward to during this open session is for the PPO benefit design, there are two um, decisions in front of the board. One is to recommend um, to eliminate cast light. The other recommendation will be to change the PPO urgent care and specialist copay by $15. 
For the preliminary rates, we want to remind that remind everyone that the 2019 rates are preliminary and the, they are being still negotiated. This is the first time not only do our members see the progress, but it is also the first time the health plans see each other's numbers. And this is typically when the pins will start to get sharpened between now and June. We will discuss more of that during that session. And then CalPERS dialysis cost and utilization. There were two dialysis ballot initiatives as of the writing of this agenda item. As of May 1st, one failed because it did not have enough signature votes or signatures. CalPERS has been providing data to the LAO and SEIU, so we wanted to make sure that you had a copy of the data that we've been providing and also be open to ask, answer any questions that you may have regarding CalPERS's specific cost and utilization. So with that, Mr. Chair, that concludes my opening remarks and I'm available for any questions. Thank you. <coughs> Seeing none, appreciate the report. Item three is the consent action calendar. So moved. We have a motion by Ms. Taylor, second, second by Mother to approve the minutes from April 17th. Uh, any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. Motion carries. Item four, the consent calendar. I've seen, had no request to pull anything off the information consent items. So it takes to item five, uh, action items, approval of the preferred provider organization 2019 benefit design changes. Ms. Donison. Good afternoon. Before Mr. you start, Ms. Donison, for those of you who don't know, the forms I talked about are in the back of the room now, so don't all run at once, but uh, <laughs> Mr. Hank, I don't push anybody. <laughs> Go ahead, Ms. Donison. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, this is agenda item number five. This is an action item. Uh, there are two benefit design changes that we will be proposing. The first is the elimination of the cast light product and then to consider uh, <coughs> some additional co-pay changes for 2019. I'll begin with a brief discussion of the recommendation regarding the discontinuation of the cast light product for all PPO plans in 2019. I'll then cover recommended benefit design changes regarding the urgent care and specialist co-pays for 2019. And Gary McCollum has joined me at the dais to discuss some of the uh, premium implications in terms of this design change. First, I'd like to start with the cast light uh, evaluation and the recommendation to discontinue it in 2019. In 2014, we did a pilot to add a transparency tool that would allow our members to identify um, quality of care with providers, cost of providers. It was a search tool as well as a transparency tool. Over the ensuing years, between 2014 and 2018, we expected that the program would be, uh, there would be uptake of the uh, program and that it would be a useful tool for our members. And indeed, I think for the members who did use it, it was a useful tool. Unfortunately, only about 24% of households actually engaged with the tool um, over that period of time. It was evaluated by an academic from Harvard, uh, Atif Marota, with uh, David Cowling of our Center for Innovation at the time, and they did a comparison uh, to a, con a sort of a control group and an experimental group, those who used it versus those who did not, essentially. And they didn't find any significant difference, and that significant difference in a statistical sense with the overall um, rate of use of the tool to control spending growth or non-use of the tool. In April, we came forward to the committee to propose eliminating the cast light tool, thereby saving $1.8 million in costs and spend for this tool. In discussions with Anthem, they will provide a transparency tool for 2019, so we do have a replacement product um, through our third party administrator. We request approval to discontinue cast light, thereby saving $1.8 million um, in program costs. The second uh, 
change, benefit design change that we're requesting is an increase of $15 in the copay for urgent care and an increase of $15 in the copay for the specialist care. There have not been any changes in copays or coinsurance or deductibles in these two plans. That's, this is a change for PERS care and PERS choice. Uh, and there have not been any changes since about 2005. We are experiencing an increase in urgent care utilization. In 2017, it went up 17% compared to a 6% drop in the use of primary care. Urgent care is a higher intensity site of care for services, which means um, more intense resources that are being utilized. We do, uh, and we have, discussed the importance of urgent care as an alternative to emergency care. So in that sense, if you look at sites of care, emergency care does have a copay and a deductible, and in many instances, emergency care can be handled uh, very, in a very fine manner in urgent care. Um, so it, that is a good alternative site of care, but in terms of primary care, uh, where resource can, the use of uh, less expensive resources occurs, we are seeing a drop. We'll talk later about the premium savings. Um, Mr. McCollum will be discussing that with you, but essentially increasing these co-pays from $20 to $35 is about a $6 per member per month uh, savings, equating to $72 per member per year. That $72 savings could cover two copay visits uh, a year. The rationale then for the increase in urgent care copay is to fund the utilization of higher cost services. For specialty care, we also recommend a $35 copay. Again, our members can go directly to a specialist rather than going through primary care, and specialists tend to order uh, more uh, and greater use of, ex of expensive services. Um, the, treatment, um, the treatment costs with the specialist care is higher than if they go to primary care, and often the primary care specialist can manage uh, most of the medical uh, needs of the patient and then refer them to a specialist if necessary. So the increase in the copay is to differentiate the total claims cost increases associated with specialist care. In April, you ask us to present more information on the financial aspects of these two copay changes, and uh, Mr. Gary McCollum is here to do just that. Gary. Thank you, Kathy. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. I'm Gary McCollum, CalPERS team member. Uh, the estimated savings that we're talking about are based on the 2018 unadjusted premiums. This provides us with the appropriate comparison to what will occur in the 2019 premiums, since the risk adjustment will not be used. <clears throat> now this slide here shows the estimated premium savings for the state and for the five regions. You can see they range from $5 to $9 per month, or $60 to $108 on an annual basis. <clears throat> so in total, these copay changes are estimated to save employees $8.3 million and save employers $2.6 million annually for a total savings of almost $11 million. So now I'd like to illustrate the impact to the member. <clears throat> On page four of your agenda item, there are two tables showing the premium savings for the employer and the employee. <clears throat> the top table is PERS choice, and the bottom table is PERS care. Now the savings for the public agency members are based on the assumption or the average savings to, an, um, to a, a public agency member of 69%. So if you look at the tables, you can see that the smallest savings for any member would be in the Los Angeles area for PERS choice at $3.42 per month. <clears throat> That's about $41 annually. 
that premium savings would cover the $15 increase for almost three visits to a specialist or an urgent care center. And if we want to look at the largest estimated savings, that would be a state employee in the PERS care plan, which is $6.97 per month, which is almost $84 annually. Now that's enough to pay the additional copay, the additional copay, the $15 increase for five visits in a year to a specialist or an urgent care center with change left over to stop at Starbucks on the way home if you'd like to. So you can see that at a minimum, even with this copay or with this, uh, yeah, this copay increase, the premium savings to a member would pay for at least two visits without incurring any additional out-of-pocket cost. So I'll turn it back to Kathy now for questions. Again, today we seek two decisions. The first decision will be to discontinue cast light, and the second decision will be for you to approve the urgent care and specialty care increase in copays by $15 each. After we take your questions, we will ask the board to vote on cast light and have, and have that decision made, and then ask the board to vote on the copay increases for urgent care and specialty care. If the board approves to discontinue cast light, we will look to decommission this tool for 2019. And to mitigate any member disruption, we will look to add the Anthem tool in 2019 at no additional cost. We will also incorporate any decision about the copay changes into the final RDP. <coughs> and this concludes our presentation, and we're happy to take questions. Thank you, Ms. Donerson, Mr. McCollum, Mr. Miller. Um, yes, I uh, just want to make sure I'm clear. Uh, this relates to the, the copay changes. So the, the increased copay for specialist visits is for any specialist visit, whether it was a referral from a primary care physician first or whether the member went directly to that specialist? That's correct. Okay, so um, again, the, the concern I have is and this is more a concern for the future as we look at these plan designs for PPO in light of what we learn with VBID and, and some of the features of, of the changes that we've made recently in that offering is I worry that the patients are members who most need to utilize specialty care, who have the higher acuity situation, who are sicker, um, than typical who have chosen this plan for that reason um, are not disproportionately bearing the, the impact because this could be really significant for, for some of our members. Um, so that, that's my concern that we're really cognizant of the, the out-of-pocket impact this will hap have on folks um, going forward. All right, seeing no other requests to speak, we do have two issues before us. Uh, action issues, we'll take up the cast light first. What's the pleasure of the committee? I'd like to move. Second. Let's, I'd like to move. <laughs> I didn't get to finish. I'd like to move that it's we discontinue. Microphone. Oh, Here's I'm sorry, microphone. is my mic on? No. No? Yes. Yes. I'd like to move that we discontinue the cast light. <laughs> Been moved by Taylor, seconded by Mother. Any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Motion carries. All right, the second item before us. Ms. Donison, you want to highlight it again, please? Uh, yes, sir. We're asking approval to increase the urgent care visit copay from $20 to $35 and increase the specialist copay visit from $20 to $35. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Would you remind us the, about the copay changes in the VBIT program that we did a few months ago? Those copay changes are right. $35 for urgent care and for specialist care. And VBIT? That is VBIT as okay. well. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay, what's the pleasure of the committee? Move staff recommendation. Moved by Mr. Gillahan, seconded by Mother. Any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Motion carries. Thank you. 
Brings us agenda item six, information items. First one is item six, preliminary 2019 health rates. Ms. Little. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, Sherry Little, CalPERS team member. Today I'm here to do our per first public uh, preview of our rate setting cycle. As you know, it runs from January to June. And this is sort of the first time we share this information with everyone on a public setting. It's been an exciting year. You, as you heard, uh, my colleague Kathy has been negotiating contracts and that's been running parallel to the rate development process. And it's been a little bit more interesting than it is normally, a little bit more busy as well. We've had a lot of improvement in the last month um, as we have continued to get better information from our health plans and experience data. So this is the time of the year that you know we're sitting down with health plans a lot. You will, um, some of the changes you'll see are also as it relates to ser service coverage areas with <coughs> regard to health net, they have requested and the board has approved exit of the Sacramento region and that includes Sacramento, Yolo and Placer counties for, from its smart care product, excuse me, at the end of the year. Additionally, the board knows that we had considered adding Aetna to our products and we have decided that it's not gonna provide an added value at this point in time and not add any additional service areas that aren't already existing. So we'll continue to evaluate that as it relates to other plans as part of the rate negotiation development process and update you as we receive more information. So moving to rates for the 2019 preliminary rates, I wanna remind everyone that the, these are just that, preliminary rates. It's the first opportunity everyone has, not only to see their own rates, in a public way, but to see other rates from the health plans. It's a great time for us to really get down to the detail and talk about what works and what doesn't work. Some of the initial observations we have with regard to the HMOs is that the, um, one to point out that the 2018, in 2018 we risk adjusted. We eliminated that for the 2019 years. So what we've tried to do is provide a hard copy in the back of the room, as well as providing that online. I apologize, it's late in the, in the game. But to give you kind of a comparison so you see what was unadjusted to adjusted final premiums as it relates to preliminary rates in the 2019 cycle. And for you will notice that most all increases were diminished as a result of the elimination but for two plans with Blue Shield and Anthem. On the PPO side, we wanted to talk about the fact that we see, again, some of the consequence of the risk adjustment, elimination of risk adjustment, are some, some experiences you'll see. We're taking a look at the increases that we've seen so far and coming back to the board in our June meeting to talk about potential options and ways of addressing that and how we want to proceed. So I wanted to remind anyone, everyone one more time, we do this over and over, Leanna did it already, but that this is preliminary, it's an ongoing process, we move through it every day. Um, with regard to the, sure. <laughs> I just want to make one point <clears throat> related to the PPO rates. Um, as many um, we will see in the back of the room and online is that um, PERS care has gone up significantly, but we have an important decision before the board between now and June. And in June open, what the board is directed is they'd like to hear public comment before they make that final decision on what that rate is. So I just wanted to sign post to our members and to our stakeholders um, that that is a key decision and that typically we would be having the June uh, final rates at the beginning but because we want to wait till June um, open session, we'll wait to publish the June rates till the end of that session. Okay. Thanks for the clarification, Leanna. Also wanted to point out with regard to public agencies, you will see it in your attachment to of your agenda item and also at the back of the room for everyone here today. Wanted to call out a couple of things. With regard to the regional factor, we know that the cost of care needs to reflect the price within a given region. There's uh, one plan that specifically calls out attention to us, and that's UHC at this point, with regard to their Bay Area and other northern areas. We've been working with them and will continue to do so as we move toward June and a final rate. 
we are mandated, as you know, to really reflect cost of care to actual, excuse me, our premiums to actual cost of care. So this is a particularly important subject for us. We've been talking about regions and regional factors for a while, and we'll have that in, in our July session with further analysis on that. But it does directly correlate to rates. I think this is a good example of that. So between now and June, again, we're working hard. We're trying to get to the right space. And uh, I will. that concludes my presentation. I welcome any questions you may have for me. Thank you. First, I want to start out by saying I, <clears throat> I understand that these are preliminary rates, um, but as I said last year, pencils didn't seem to get sharpened yet, and it's time that we take this seriously. I think some of the plans have forgot who they're actually serving here. These are the public servants that serve California. That's not the top 1%. Uh, so when we're looking at these kind of increases, they cannot be sustained. So I think we need to step back. We need to do a better job of sharpening these pencils and coming to the table seriously. Uh, let's not take it for granted that this board has in the past dropped health plans. And it's not something that we're not apt to do again. So I want to make sure that everyone's on board knowing that we want the best rates possible for our members going forward. We're here to protect the system or protect these members. And we want to make sure that everybody's doing their job. So if the health plans are here, which I know they are, <clears throat> please heed these warnings. We want you to come to the table with your best prices, your best pencils, your smartest folks that can help work with our staff. I know our staff's been working very hard to work through this process, but the plans need to come to the table as well. So we want to make sure, from my perspective, that these are not, uh, these, most of these rates are not acceptable, and we need to make sure that we're getting a better job. And it shouldn't have to be every year. We have to make the same statement in May so we can play this dance game and come back in June with better numbers. Show up the first time with good numbers so we don't have to have these discussions. So with that, I will move on. Ms. Taylor? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I also want to uh, echo what Chair Fechner said. I, one of the things that I worry about is when every time these rates go up, um, my members, myself included, lose pay. So we get a raise and it gets eaten up by health care rates every single time, every single year. And as Mr. Fechner said, these are unacceptable rate increases. We, I talked about this earlier in closed session. Um, there's specific plans here that um, I think we've fought with them long enough. I'm not sure we need to continue having these plans in our, in our portfolio. I don't know that that's necessary. But what I do know is if we are going to continue to deal with them, the last thing I want to see next year is May and us not having answers, final answers for our members. And, and for this year, they need to go back and really, really work with our staff to make sure they come in with rates that our members can afford. I'm very disappointed in a lot of these rates. Um, I'm looking at the regional rates, and it's appalling. I'm looking at some of the, the state rates from some of the plans, and they're appalling. And I, and I request that these um, the insurers go back and do better. That's what I'm asking you guys to do. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Jones. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, I echo my colleagues' uh, comments also about the rates and negotiations and as a matter of fact, I think it was even two years ago we entered into the same kind of dialogue. dialogue. We're going back and forth. And, and for one, I've uh, indicated to staff to let them know that if they can't make the changes, don't even come back to discuss it with us anymore. Because we've gone through this process more than once. And if they're coming back with the same numbers, we don't want to hear it. So just let them know that we're not going to even listen when they come back if it's the same. Thank you. Ms. Mother. Thank you. Um, well, I, I concur with my colleagues that there are definitely certain plans that need to do a lot better than they've done uh, up till now in terms of the rates. I do have a question. Um, on the, in the agenda item on page, uh, sorry, page, the last page of the agenda item, I don't have a page number on it, sorry. Um, it talks about the pharmacy trend and particularly it calls out that while OptumRx is the PBM for the majority of our HMO plans, it is not for Blue Shield and of course Kaiser, which has, is an integrated system. 
Have we reconsidered whether that is an appropriate, um, that it's, it remains the right decision to carve out Blue Shield from the PBM contract? Great question, and it's one of the trends that we're really reviewing right now. For this year, um, it's here to stay, but that's something we'll be evaluating in the next rate cycle. Okay, I think we really Thank should look at that, particularly if that is an element driving the rates. Um, we want to make sure that we have as much control over how the around the pharmacy trend, and I think we've been doing a lot of innovative things, um, adopting a lot of innovative um, pilot initiatives that could help us to continue to bend the trend um, So on pharmacy, so thank you. Thank you. Mr. Miller. Again, I, I concur with the comments of my colleagues, and uh, the additional thing I would highlight again is the impact on the out-of-pocket cost to our members and where I really, my eye just immediately jumps to the PERS care increase. The magnitude of this increase for those members who have chosen that plan because they need that plan because of its features, because of their health care needs and issues. People with more serious health care issues, higher acuity issues who really chose that plan because it's the plan they need. This kind of increase, they're probably the least likely to be able to afford this. So it has a really disparate impact on, on those folks, and, and we've really got to do better for them. Thank you. Mr. LaFaso. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just a clarification for staff, I uh, also want to say I appreciate all the other members' comments, and I agree. Um, I don't want to get ahead of staff, but uh, I just want to underscore, apropos to the issue that Mr. Miller just raised about the sharp uh, comparison between the 18 PERS care rate and the 19 PERS care rate, just to clarify that in prior May sessions, we've given the public an unadjusted rate comparison year over year and a risk-adjusted rate comparison year over year. But because this year we've discontinued risk adjustment, now they're getting a comparison of a adjusted rate from 2018 with a non-adjusted rate for 2019, which notably brings some rates down and sharply increases some other rates. And the notable ones to focus on would be Blue Shield Access and uh, PERS Care. Um, maybe one or two others. Um, can, can I just uh, get some comment from staff just to make sure that the, the public's understanding this difference between the retail adjusted and retail non-adjusted rates from 18 to 19? That's correct. Thank you for the comment, Mr. LaFaso. You are correct, and um, I, we should have clarified that a little better, but that's exactly right. Appreciate that. Um, that, of course, uh, I also just want to quickly comment on the regional rating issue and your attention to United Healthcare. Um, I know we had a good discussion about this at the January offsite about how we're approaching the regional rating factors. Um, I really appreciate what you all are doing with United Healthcare um, and making sure those swings are manageable and reflected by the appropriate cost measure. Uh, candidly, I hope we do more of this going forward, but really appreciate what you're doing with uh, United Healthcare uh, at this juncture. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing no other requests from the dais, we do have a number of requests from the audience. So when I, I'll call your name, if three at a, for call three at a time, please come down to the, uh, your right, my left, and the microphones will be turned on for you. You'll have up to three minutes to speak, and uh, please give your name and affiliation for the record. First, I have Michelle Volrath, followed by Tim Barons, followed by Larry Woodson. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and fellow board members. Um, this is Michelle Volrath. I'm the Vice President from United Healthcare. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. We truly appreciate the privilege to serve those who serve us, and we do not take that responsibility lightly. During, during the past four and a half years, we have priced our basic plan offering 
utilizing all the data available and done so appropriately and responsibly. Some of the factors impacting our rates include contract changes, different vendors of offerings entering and leaving the different markets, our, uh, the claimed experience of our members, and the demographics. Although our membership looks relatively unchanged from 2017 to 2018, we saw significant movement changing our overall footprint in both the north and south, which does impact our rates as well. With that said, our regional factors continue to be supported by our experience in those regions. And as we gain insight to another month of experience, we continue to see similar trends emerging. We heard your concerns last year, and we worked with staff offering a potential solution by utilizing the elimination of the ACA taxes to offset the Bay Area regional rates rather than spreading the impact across all of the regions. After providing some modeling, these options were rejected by staff Therefore, we provided some additional alternative options to consider. One option was to subsidize the Bay Area region, <coughs> that does exist, with the other regions. And the other option was to consider a network change in the Bay Area specifically that would result in savings. Um, unfortunately, these also were rejected too. Um, but we are committed to continuing to provide a strong option for CalPERS members. And we'll continue to work collaboratively with staff to do so. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you, and we hope that you continue to work hard for staff to do a better rate for our members. Absolutely. They're still too high. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Behrens. Uh, thank you, Chairman Fechner and uh, members of the committee. I'm Tim Behrens, the President of the California State Retirees. Thank you for the opportunity to comment. Uh, California State Retirees is very concerned with the preliminary rates released this afternoon and with the process itself. Anthem HO, HMO Traditional Blue Shield Access Plus Anthem, EPO, Del Norte, PERS Choice, and PERS Care all show large premium increases over the current year. While staff provides us with the monthly premium rates, they don't give us the CalPERS contribution rates, so we will know how these increases will actually affect our out-of-pocket costs. I think several of you mentioned that. We don't see them till June when the rates have been permanently fixed. While those on Medicare who are fully vested will likely have their premiums fully covered, those retirees not on Medicare, but on basic plans, and retirees on Medicare but with spouses and college-age children on their insurance will likely be hit hard by those increased premiums. For those on PERS care, they will get a double whammy by having their deductibles increased for urgent care and specialists. We think it was ill-advised for CalPERS to abandon using risk adjustment for the, the 219 uh, season because that will clearly increase our out-of-pocket costs for those on the more expensive plans. For those in the 18 rural counties, this forces those on PERS care to choose between paying much more in premiums per month using current year CalPERS contribution amounts, or choosing a cheaper plan that has worse coverage, PERS choice, PERS select, and having to pay twice as much coinsurance for non-preventative medical treatment. These preferred rates seem to arbitrarily single out a particular subset of retirees and force them to pay more for the same coverage or choose a lesser plan and even face having to change physicians in some cases. We ask the board members and the staff to find a fair method of rate setting before finalizing these rates in June. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Woodson. Larry Woodson, California State Retirees. Thank you for the opportunity to comment. There's a lot of information here. I hope I don't run over three minutes. I hope you'll uh, indulge me a little bit if I do. As Mr. Barron stated, the preliminary rates released, I have just this morning, but it's afternoon now, uh, will create hardships for members, especially combination plan members and those retirees not on Medicare. Uh, unfortunately, we aren't provided with the preliminary rates for combo families or for two or three party plans. This is only for single party. Uh, and also, we don't see how much uh, CalPERS contribution rates for fully vested 190 members is. So we're pretty much in the dark 
ballpark on exactly uh, how hard we're going to be hit. But for the single party information that we do, do have and the five plans that uh, uh, Mr. Barron's mentioned, there, there are significant increases and of course uh, board members have already pointed out the, uh, the significant hit for uh, PERS uh, care. And I'll just speak for a second to the to the issue of the insurance rates because PERS care, the, the PPOs are self-funded plans and that's a different manner in which you reach these uh, rates. For the insurance companies, frankly, and I've mentioned this before, but with the tax cuts of 15% to these insurance companies, they're going to be reaping millions and millions of dollars in profits in 2019, the same year you're implementing these uh, rates. And so I would hope that uh, there would be a little more flexibility on the part of the insurers. Regarding the self-funded rates, you're, you're setting them based on actuarial uh, data from the previous year and there's not a, a lot of flexibility I suppose you're not negotiating with anyone and so it makes it uh, more onerous uh, to see this high rate I don't know what this 929 figure is there's an asterisk here it I, I don't really understand what the asterisk means maybe that's what you hope to come in with at the final so <coughs> what I did is just I ran the numbers of uh, uh, the 1114, and that's $389 more a month for just for a single payer. And if you use the 929, that's still $205 more a month for a single payer. That's $2,460 in a year. This isn't for multiple uh, plan, uh, multiple family member plans. This is just for the single. They're going to be more for the, for the uh, multiple family uh, plans. The last thing I want to cover is the risk adjustment by uh, not, by abandoning risk adjustment, which is something that did bring PERS care and would bring PERS care down. Uh, you, in, in just nine months ago, there was a uh, report to this committee that said, quote, uh, risk adjustment allows the board and plan carriers flexibility to differentiate without, without adverse impact to members financially. Two, it addresses cherry picking, carriers pricing premiums to attract healthiest members. Three, it's currently being done by University of California and other major providers in California. And lastly, uh, it, the positive aspects include more data from carriers than before it was implemented, more plan choices since it was implemented and may be partly responsible for the very modest premium increases CalPERS has been experiencing in 2017 and 18. So why uh, that's been abandoned as a tool, uh, I don't know, I don't understand, and the results are before us in a, in a monthly premium of $1,114, which will basically <laughs> force people in rural counties into less coverage worse plans, they don't have choices of HMOs. I hope that the board will take a serious look and the staff at making major revisions, particularly in the self-funded plans. Uh, this is just not fair, thank you. Thank you. Before we go to the next three, would someone from staff like to get up and explain the asterisks? Sure. Kyle, can you bring up that slide, please? I'll do it, sure. <coughs> So one of the things that we wanted to um, highlight is that um, for PERS, for PERS Care and PERS Choice, so everyone is aware, they are the exact same networks. Um, PERS Care is a 90-10 plan, and PERS Choice is an 80-20. So they're exactly the same, they just have, one has a richer benefit than the other. Historically, um, PERS Choice um, the other PPO plans have been offsetting the cost of PERS care, so that's what risk adjustment did. With eliminating risk adjustment, what we are seeing between the 2018 final premium and the 2019 preliminary is purely the result of right sizing. That is the true cost of a 90-10 plan is a $1,114.41. Um, what we 
talked about and close, and I'm, I'm just gonna mention it again, is we wanted to provide options to the board, and as such, what the board has decided is during open session in June, we will be bringing back an open dialogue and be able to vote at that time if we want to figure out a way to get the premium down to $929.88. And so it's to um, potentially offset so we don't have this huge swing and kind of smooth it out between now and um, over the, you know, the 2019 rate period. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. So the next three to speak, George Lynn, Neil Johnson, Crystal McCray. Please come forward. Good afternoon, my name is George Lynn. Uh, Mr. Chair, committee members, other board members. While I don't disagree with anything that you've already heard, I'm on a little different track. I'm a contract agency person. And you know, let's take a look at these contract agency things. I live in the Bay Area, so the premium is 1,504, but if I'm in Los Angeles, it's 629, that's $875 difference. That's more than 100% difference over the Los Angeles area. And the previous year, the difference was 769. So why did the difference go up? I thought that we were looking at finding ways to kind of uh, massage these regions so that there was some equity in these regions. Remembering that the contract agencies are not part of the state and so the state employees who have the 190 formula and those kinds of things, the contract agencies don't have those. So this is a direct hit on the members that live in those areas. And you know, I, I find that even if you're looking at the difference between United Health, I'm talking about United Healthcare, obviously. If I'm looking at the United Healthcare for Southern, uh, for the um, Sacramento area, if I'm looking at the difference between anything and the Bay Area, the Bay Area people are just being hijacked. We need to find a way. We keep hearing that we're going to have this wonderful gathering and meeting to try and figure out ways to massage these regions. Um, I may not live that long, and I plan to live a long time, in spite of what things may seem. <laughs> but, um, you know, I think we need to get, get on the track on this thing, because it is outrageous that that difference is that great. Maybe there's a difference, but that much? So that's my concern. I think that we need to take a better look at that number, especially the United Healthcare Bay Area number as it relates to other uh, regions in the state. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Johnson? Could you take her first? Certainly. Ms. McCray. <coughs> Neil's still writing. <laughs> yes. Good afternoon. Chair, board members, it is an honor to speak with you today. My name is yeah, give you your name. My name is Crystal McRae, and I work for the state of California, California Environmental Protection Agency. I'm an AGPA, and I've been with the state 30 years this year in February. So the, the, the decisions that you make affect me deeply and real, in real time. As I listen to the conversations about the health care increases today, I'm going to take a slightly different tact. The numbers are important, but for me, 
I think that what's important are my family, our quality of life, and the families of the 95,000 members that we represent at SEIU Local 1000. Myself, I am the doting grandmother of three beautiful grandchildren. And since they've been born, the ages are 11, 11, and three. I have tried to think of ways that I could really have a long-lasting impact on their lives. Rather than buying video games and toys, I've decided to invest in experiences. Those exper experiences include ballet, Boys and Girl Scouts of America, and tutoring. And each time that I get a raise, and my greatest thought is how I can invest in them and the future even greater, the health care increases takes away just a little bit. And every time I take away from an experience of these children, I take away from the future of America. And that's how it impacts my household. Now, don't get me wrong, I have coworkers who have to make the choice between health care, medication, therapy, and all type of physical ailments against their wallets, which is also very unfair. Thankfully, I do not have a health care story, but please consider myself, the 95,000 members that we represent at SEIU Local 1000, and the children of America and their futures. This is also being affected. And the one thing I'd like to say is that it's not just here for our members that health care is becoming unsustainable and unbearable. It's all over America. We must hold these insurers accountable. And I would like to say that we want to partner with you, the PERS board, as we move forward in understanding that it is important that our members not only have a living wage, but attainable and sustainable health care cost. Thank you so much for your time, and thank you so much for listening. Thank you. Mr. Mm -hmm. Johnson. Uh, Neil Johnson, SEIU 1000. Um, I come to today to talk a little about options. The board and some of those have been mentioned a little. Uh, you know, we could eliminate plans in the future. Um, we, another option that has been used before is to freeze enrollments. Um, that one I think was fairly effective. Uh, we could, an example was talked about a little earlier about pharmacy benefits. You know, we, Optum provides pharmacy benefits for a number of plans, but we have three plans that still run their own pharmacy. Uh, we may want to think about, do we really want all of those plans running pharmacies? And another one which has been also tried is removing certain providers. Uh, hospital networks or something, I know it may create problems with access in certain areas and HMO licensing, but those are options. Uh, we have looked over the last few years at risk adjustment and now we're going away from it, for better or for worse, but those are some of your options. Um, the health plans also have options, and Mr. Fechner, I think, in his opening remarks was very apropos. Um, you got to really sharpen your pencil, really work to roll these rates to somewhat reasonable numbers. I mean, we see my first reaction was a real mixed bag of some going down, some going up. Uh, Mr. Lapasso pointed out that, yes, that was, we previously had risk adjustments, so we're looking at one set of numbers versus another that are totally similar, but uh, some of the rates we were seeing were really obscenely increase, obscene increases, and so maybe that really will force the board to exercise one of its options, or the plan are choosing their option of saying goodbye and no longer being public servants to California. And those, I think, are the options that really need to be explored over the next uh, 30 days. And then some of them are maybe longer term issues of how, you know, we go five year plans. We might want to go uh, one year with some of them. And if you haven't shaped up, that's sayonara time. Anyway, uh, I wish you the best of luck in these deliberations, and we will um, provide whatever input we can. Thank you very much. And Thank you. <clears throat> so that exhausts the uh, speaker's request list. We want to say let's just stay tuned. 
We have 30 days. We'll be back having this discussion again, and hopefully the plans that are here have been paying attention, and they'll decide to sit down and work diligently with our staff and decide whether or not they choose to stay in our fund system or not. Uh, so with that, we move on to item seven, CalPERS dialysis utilization and cost. Ms. Bailey Crimmins. Good afternoon, Mr. Good Chair, afternoon. <laughs> board uh, members, Leanna Bailey Crimmins, CalPERS team member. Today before you is an information item on the utilization and cost of dialysis treatment for CalPERS as members. We bring this item today to you because at the time we were preparing this agenda item, there were two ballot initiatives related to um, establishing state regulation on um, kidney dialysis clinics. The first initiative was 1810. It set limits for patient charges and imposed penalties when charges were deemed excessive. The second initiative was 1811, which places operational requirements such as staffing standards as well as limits. Um, when it comes to the price dialysis clinic, clinics may charge. Due to having not enough signatures, 1811 initiative, which was the second initiative, failed on May 1st. The Legislative Analyst Office has contacted us for information to assist them during their analysis phase of the ballot initiative, and SEIU has also requested information for, uh, from us. So in your board books and um, also in the back of the room, we've included the data analysis that was provided to date, went in full transparency. We also want to point out there was a typo. That's one of the reasons that it is also in the back of the room. Instead of HMO Medicare, it said HMO Basic, so we've corrected that, and that again is available in the back of the room. We felt that it was important that you as committee members receive the same information and have an opportunity to ask the health team questions if you have them regards to this particular agenda item. As a reminder, a member diagnosed with end-stage renal um, disease or permanent kidney failure is, requires long-term dialysis treatment. And as such, the law states that a person diagnosed with ESRD who's on a commercial health plan, which our members are, can become eligible for Medicare for, during a three-month waiting period and a 30-day coordination period. So after 33 months, CalPERS de is deemed the primary insurer. It's an automatic qualifier. So for CalPERS members on our health plans, um, once the 33-month coordination period has elapsed, they now may become Medicare, and Medicare will become the primary insurer. CalPERS will become the secondary insurer. So when it comes to our data, in 2017, there were 1,550 CalPERS members receiving dialysis treatment, which is about 1% of our health program members. 998 were in Medicare, and 552 in basic, again, as people transition, depending on where that 33-month period is. Slide five shows our utilization and costs. So in 2017, CalPERS spent $62 million on dialysis treatment. And the basic members, because we were the primary insurer, received 33% of the treatment, but was 58% of the CalPERS cost. CalPERS is a strong negotiator, and as such, our unit price for dialysis treatments are below the benchmark. The benchmark is MedInsight, which is a Milliman actuary tool. And if you can see on the slide, our unit price in basic plans was $632 or $631, which was 8.2% below the benchmark. And for Medicare, it was $227, which is 7% below the benchmark. In summary, the CalPERS legislative team will continue to monitor this initiative and will keep the board apprised if we get any additional information or request. With that, that concludes my opening or my um, comments. And if there's any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Thank you, Ms. Mother. Yes, I. You know, I've read several news reports around um, dialysis, and not just the pricing of dialysis, but also how well some of these private providers of dialysis are um, really treating and delivering care to our mem to members, and, or to patients rather. And some of the concerns I've heard are that they try to get too much throughput and they don't do an adequate job of recalibrating and cleaning the equipment and so members or patients could get um, an infection or some other, or some other um, problem could arise from that. Another is that, mem that uh, patients might not be apprised of their options, that dialysis might not be their only option, that perhaps a kidney transplant would actually be a better option for prolonging life and ensuring quality of life, but that because these dialysis um, centers are trying to increase their numbers, they are not 
adequately advising uh, patients around those. So those are a couple of the concerns that I've heard. And I'm wondering, have you looked at this from a quality of care, um, best practices, evidence-based care perspective, and, and, and uh, some of those risks to, our, to patients and our members specifically? Um, so specifically, this information I was just to show you the data of who is from a demographics, from a cost utilization. We have not dived into the quality of care piece. Um, obviously, that's related. We don't have access to the medical records, but we can definitely see if there are appeals, if there are issues, are the outcomes uh, of what we're expecting for our members for any condition that they have are are being treated as such. Um, obviously, we have one view into it as the primary insurer, and then after 33 months, they go into Medicare. So that, that lens shifts a little bit. Um, but if you're interested in getting more information around that, we would be happy to bring that back. I do think it would be worth doing a survey of what studies are available around the, the kind of care that's being delivered. And I, I'm not necessarily setting a particular time frame when this should be come back. I think we should work with the chair as to what's what's appropriate. But I, I, I do think it would be worth ensuring that our members are getting the best possible care and that they're being well taken care of. Um, and so uh, I, I would suggest that we should look, we should dive a little deeper into this issue. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Taylor. So yes, I want I want to echo Ms. Mother's sentiments here because as I understand it um, we're 58 percent cost out of 33 percent usage is that correct so what we're saying is that the 1,550 members, the 1%, 1 when we looked at that, uh, there's two groups. There's the people that we are the primary insurer on, right. which is um, the 552 basic members. There, and then there's the 998 people that are Medicare, where they are, we are the secondary insurers. For basic members, which is the 552, they received 33% of the treatment, but obviously we're 58% of the cost because we were the primary insurer. Right. So, I, and I think that's part of one of the problems that we see here. It, it, there's very few companies, there's no competition. Um, and these companies tend to charge what they can, all the market can bear. And I think that's what we're seeing when it, when we have to pay for it for our first 33 months or whatever, however long it was. Um, so I think it's important and imperative that we kind of do a deep dive on the care, the cost, um, and, I, and I have heard more than a few reports over the, the level of care of these facilities and how dangerous they are. That and that um, they aren't giving them, um, they aren't giving their patients the options. They're not even informing them of the options of possibly a transplant. And, and I think that it's an important that we look at these issues because it is, um, these are, not a lot of our members, but these are some of our members. Thank you. Seeing no other requests to speak, I do have a number of requests from the audience. Uh, so I'll call you down two at a time. Please, over here on my left, your right. Ladies, please stay there in case there's any questions. Uh, we have uh, first two are David Miller, sorry, get off the dais, <laughs> and Thomas Hilchek. Please come on down. <laughs> Hello, I'm David Miller from SEIU UHW. I'm the research director, and I wanted to thank you for uh, raising this issue. Um, thank you, chair and board. Uh, it's a very important issue. We think dialysis is a very significant cost driver um, throughout healthcare. Uh, and so um, to that end, um, I think we'll be seeking your endorsement for our ballot measure, the Fair Pricing uh, for Dialysis Act. It runs right at this uh, issue. Uh, the issue of competition was raised. Uh, we've um, hopefully circulated a study from Blue Sky, uh, which will show you that there is um, significant uh, problems with competition in the market. 80% uh, of the market 
is consolidated into, I'm sorry, 70% of the market is consolidated into two providers. When you run uh, a, an HHS index, which the Justice Department uses to look at consolidation of markets, uh, it is considered an extremely consolidated market, which is troubling as a purchaser of healthcare. Um, you're going to have difficulties getting a good price. Monopolies also have other uh, side effects, um, lower quality, lower patient choice. We think this actually may be impacting the transplant issue that people have raised. If you uh, look at, I also handed out a quick PowerPoint that the for-profits have a significantly lower um, rate of putting people on the transplant list, which means you have a less chance of getting a transplant uh, than the nonprofits. Um, so we think the profit motive um, is raising serious questions. Um, so we think there's a lot to dive in here. Um, we think our ballot measure uh, addresses um, a lot of these issues. Um, we use a medical loss ratio uh, to regulate the industry uh, so that um, the cost of uh, providing care is not necessarily impacted. It's a metric that's used on the insurance side of the industry. Um, for that very reason, you want to pay for direct medical care. Um, you want to limit overhead and profits. Uh, so that why, is why we selected it. Um, and then I would just say, uh, you'll probably see things in the news about what's included and what's not included in our ballot measure. And I just want to say for the record that physicians and medical directors are actually covered under our ballot measure. So I just want to be crystal clear on that because there's been some misinformation. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, members. My name is Tom Hiltak. I'm representing the California Dialysis Council this afternoon and also the ballot measure committee opposed to the dialysis measure. Um, the members of the California Dialysis Council serve about 66,000 Californians who receive da daily di or three times a week dialysis treatment for periods of four hours at a time, and about 1,500 CalPERS members, as you've been told. Um, about 75 organizations have already taken positions against the initiative, including the California Medical Association, the California Chapter of the American College of Emergency Physicians, the American Nurses Association, and many other health leaders. This measure is dangerous for patients and is costly for CalPERS. I wrote a letter to Ms. Bailey Kremens last week, and I've made a copy of that available to you that outlines many of the issues that I'm going to discuss briefly today. For starters, CalPERS itself, as a government payer, is exempt from the initiative itself. And therefore, there, because CalPERS is a government payer, there is no benefit, no financial benefit to CalPERS. And in fact, because of the way the initiative is written, there's actually a financial hit to CalPERS, um, namely in higher costs for your members. Um, simply put, this initiative has the, creates a business operating situation where clinics will be driven out of business. They'll have to reduce access, limit care, or, or actually um, leave the field of dialysis treatment. The reason for that is because the price limit is set at 115% of direct patient care cost, but the definition of direct patient care cost is extremely limited. And therefore, um, Bill Hamm, the former legislative analyst for the state of California and now a, an economic consultant with the Berkeley Research Group, analyzed this initiative and concluded that as many as 83% of clinics would have net operating losses as a consequence of this initiative. That directly affects access and care for your CalPERS members. More importantly, what happens is when a patient is unable to get treatment at a, at a outpatient setting like a dialysis clinic, they're left really no alternative except to go to the hospital. And in most cases, that's the emergency room. And as you know, that's probably the most expensive place to receive medical care. That directly affects the cost drivers that affect your health premiums as you've been talking about this afternoon. So for all these reasons and the reasons outlined in my letter, we will be respectfully requesting you to oppose this initiative. It's dangerous for your, for your members and costly for CalPERS. Thank you. Thank you. The next two are Itasha Hamid and Terry Brennan. I'm sure I butchered that, but I tried not to. <laughs> It took me 30 years just to learn how to spell it, so <laughs> I'm Mr. Hamid, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for letting me speak over here. My name is Edish Sham Hamid. 
uh, and I am actually a caregiver with Fresenius. Um, and I just like to say I oppose this initiative, this ballot initiative. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Brennan. Mr. Chair and members, Terry Brennan on behalf of SEIU California. Um, I'm not gonna belabor you with uh, a discussion about the initiative per se. Um, I think that once it's before you, we'll have that debate and conversation. I wanna echo the comments of uh, Ms. Mother and Ms. Taylor about gathering accurate information about the industry and what this initiative does relative to the uh, industry when it's before you, I think sometime in June. Um, I'd encourage you to look very closely because even though you have a small 1% of your population currently in dialysis, it's one of the fastest growing medical procedures in the entire medical industry. And it, if it's not a problem for you now, it will be soon and this business model is not sustainable for your members and your health systems. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Let's see, you know the request. Anything else, Ms. Bailey Crimmins? No, that, that is it. All right, thank you. It brings us to agenda item eight, summary of committee direction. Do you have any summaries? I have one item um, based on the dialysis conversation we just had. Um, we would like to uh, provide a survey or at least some analysis regarding di a, a full dialysis study regarding health outcomes and cost for our members and to be able to bring that back to you. Um, the question I'd like to ask is, um, is there a specific time that you'd like that to come for you? Ms. Mother? I don't think there's a time frame. Ms. Taylor said she could wait till August, so. All right, thank, thank you. you. Uh, bring this to agenda item nine. Oh, Mr. Jones, just a second. Yes, sir. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, uh, Mr. Chair, I wonder if it would, uh, and maybe they are planning to do this, but a few of the speakers talked about the actual rates the member pays in our proposals, so I wonder if we could get that information also when you come back in, in June, out of pocket. Yeah, typically we provide the, the 190, the 8080, okay. and once we know what those are, we will share what that expense okay. is um, from a member perspective. Okay, thank you. Very good, thank you. Brings us to agenda item nine, public comment. I have one request from the public. Mr. Fontaine, please come forward. Good afternoon. This, Good afternoon. I'm Jerry Fontaine. I'm the Chief Financial Officer for the California State Retirees, and I appreciate this opportunity to speak to the board. What I would like to do at this time is just make the um, board aware of a Senate joint resolution that is currently in, in Appropriations Committee, and the subject of that resolution has to deal with firearms. I'm not going to address anything about firearms, but contained in that resolution uh, is a statement that the resolution calls upon the California Public Employees Retirement System to engage with companies with which it is invested that produce and sell firearms to determine a reasonable method for those companies to withdraw from the production and sale of firearms. And if they're not successful, <laughs> CalPERS is to produce a plan to divest from those companies. Provisions under the California Constitution allows the legislature to retain its authority by statute to continue to prohibit investments by the retirement board where it is in the public interest to do so and provide that provisions satisfy the standards of fiduciary care and loyalty required of a retirement board. Now, having said that, existing law provides under the California Constitution that the members of a retirement board of a public pension or retirement system shall discharge their duties with respect to this system solely in the interest of and for the exclusive purpose of providing benefits to participants and their beneficiaries. Mm. 
The fiduciary responsibility of this board uh, uh, under the California Constitution, which vests the sole and exclusive fiduciary responsibilities over the assets of public pension or retirement system is with this board. Now, having said that, uh, Calif the CalPERS is the largest public retirement pension system in the country, investing billions of dollars across multiple asset classes. Investments returns sustained a large portion of CalPERS' ability to provide pensions and retirement benefits to its members. In the 2015 analysis by the Wilshire Association, found that provisions previous investment efforts have collectively reduced the present value at that time of the CalPERS portfolio by an estimated $8.3 billion. Today we have heard because of recent divestments, it is over $10 billion now. And it's believed that the CalPERS is empowered to fulfill the commitments to its stakeholders and exercise their fiduciary responsibility and not be swayed by uh, social issues with the investments and not to allow the legislature to pass any legislation that would direct this board one way or another how to invest in the future of CalPERS and its stakeholders. Thank you. We thank you for your comments, and staff and the board will be watching that carefully. Thank you. So you know the request to come before us. This meeting is adjourned. Finance will start at 140. Didn't even bother to ask, did you? No. <laughs>